Welcome to HEC TV's live interactive program that's part of St. Louis. The whole production is pulled together. It's going to be a steel bridge. The way the cockpit is designed. The highest rated green building in the world. Welcome to HEC TV Live. Welcome to the Missouri History Museum, located in St. Louis, Missouri, in gorgeous Forest Park. You're seeing video footage right now of the exterior of the museum, and we're here today because the program that we're talking about inside the artist studio, Drummer Boys Battle Drum the Civil War, is actually happening at the auditorium that's here at the Missouri History Museum. Metro Theater Company will be performing this play throughout the month of January. In addition, the Missouri History Museum has just opened a fabulous new exhibition called The Civil War in Missouri, and we're going to be meeting some folks related to that Civil War exhibition, as well as the director of the play, actors of the play, and we're excited to be here. Hi, everybody. I'm Tim Gore, your host for HEC TV Live, and I'm very happy to welcome you to the Missouri History Museum, the auditorium here, where behind me you see the stage for the play that's called Battle Drum, which will begin its student matinee performances next Tuesday with hundreds of student groups coming for a number of weeks into this auditorium, and we'll also have public general audience performances in the evenings as well. As always, HEC TV Live is interactive. We're going to be joined by a group of students from Birdville, Texas via video conference. I look forward to talking to you guys in just a few minutes as we begin to interact with you. But I want to remind all of the folks who are watching us over the web or on television that you can send us your email questions throughout the program to live at hectv.org. That's live at hectv.org. Throughout the course of the program, I'm going to be getting your email questions on my phone right here. And if life is good, I'll be hearing that little ding and we'll uh, be able to return to your question and answer them. If we, there are more questions than we get to during the program, don't worry about it. Keep sending them to us at live at hectv.org, and we will answer those questions for you after the program as well. So as I mentioned, the name of the production is called Battle Drum. Hopefully you have some familiar, familiarity with the fact that during the Civil War, all sorts of young people actually served as drummer boys. Young men served as drummer boys. And what we're going to talk a little bit about today is the historic context of the Civil War, both in Missouri as well as youth involvement in the Civil War. We're going to see scenes from the play Battle Drum as we meet the director and actors who are part of that production. And we're also going to learn a little bit about drumming as we meet Terry Artis, the director of Show Me Sound, who has taught these actors how to use the drums properly because of course the drum is an exceptionally important element of success on the battlefield in the Civil War and you'll learn more about that in today's program. To begin then though we want to get a little historic context of what's going on in the Civil War in Missouri during this period of time and of course the relationship of kids to the Civil War. So I'm happy to invite into our program now Daniel Gonzalez from the Missouri History Museum. Daniel thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, great to be here Tim. I'm glad to have you. Well first of all give the folks a little bit of information about what you do here at the History Museum and what's your relationship to the Civil War exhibition. Sure, I'm a researcher here at the, at the Missouri History Museum, so all of the content, all of the writing that goes into the exhibitions, I help with all of that. Very cool, and you've been doing that a long time? No, just a few years. I'm fairly new to this game. So when you came to the, did you already have an interest in the Civil War before you began working on this exhibition, or is this like, oh my gosh, the Civil War? Um, you know, I had an interest, but you know, it wasn't my primary interest until I got involved with this, and I really came to find this subject absolutely fascinating and central to the overall story of the United States and, and of the world. Well, give the folks a little bit of overview, because if they come to the History Museum, they'll have a chance to see this exhibition, which Absolutely. is here until when? Um, it's here for a year and a half. So if your travel plans aren't immediate, you can still make it. Got some Talk time. a little bit about the exhi exhibition. What will they find when they get here? Sure. The exhibition covers the broad story of the Civil War inside the state of Missouri. So we wanted to show you kind of before the war begins, how these tensions grow within the state and within the country over the issues of slavery and secession. Um, you'll t learn about the Dred Scott case, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and how each of these events kind of build tensions. Um, beyond that, you'll learn about how those tensions explode into violent conflict. And you've got all sorts of artifacts, obviously, as part of the exhibition, and we're going to have a yes. chance to show our folks uh, some images of that. Let's start with an artifact that relates to the, the battle at Camp Jackson, sure. which is at the beginning of the Civil War struggle here in Missouri, right? Yes, yes, very early. Um, it actually takes place May 10th, 1861, and this event is really central um, because at Camp Jackson you have a largely secessionist Missouri militia that's established itself, it's, that has established itself in Lindell Grove. Um, Lindell Grove is near modern-day uh, St. Louis University. Okay, that's right in the center of the city, basically, for those yes. of you who are not from the St. Louis area. Yeah, so they've established themselves there, and their goal, their, the prize that they're seeking, is really the St. Louis arsenal, mm. filled with weapons 
the conventional logic would have been who can ever control those weapons would control the state. Um, so unionist forces are doing what they can to jockey for position to make sure they can continue to control that arsenal. And this Missouri militia muster um, is trying to control it. Uh, a ardent, you know, very uh, passionate unionist general uh, captured that militia uh -huh. muster. Um, his name was General Nathaniel Lyon. Um, he took a largely um, German group of troops, surrounded the camp, and very peacefully um, got their surrender. Oh. Um, as they marched back to the arsenal, uh, which is near the uh, riverfront, closer to the riverfront, uh, they actually had a mob of people grow. So all of these people start coming out. Rocks begin to be, th to be thrown. And like a lot of these stories, um, the actual first shot Whoever fired it, we don't know. Uh -huh. Did it come from the crowd? Did it come from one of um, these troops who were fairly new to conflict? Um, we don't know, but the end result was um, ensuing gunshots, and almost 30 people were killed, including a 14-year-old girl, um, which starts to get us thinking about children. Mm -hmm. um, men, women, children, all ages, ethnicities, races, everyone is affected by the war in Missouri. It really was a war of no quarter. And we're going to talk about children a little bit more, but I also want to move out of the St. Louis area because the folks who are joining us in outstate Missouri, there were yes. battles out there too. And one of the important ones at the early stages of the war was at Wilson's Creek. Yes. So the Battle of Wilson's Creek took place near Springfield, Missouri. It took place in August of 1861, so just a few months after Camp Jackson. Um, and you have a Unionist force that is largely outnumbered by um, Missouri militia with Confederate regulars who have come into the state. Um, Nathaniel Lyon, who had captured Camp Jackson, is actually killed at this battle, um, along with uh, thousands of others. And so this is the first really large bloodshed within the state, and it really calcifies for everyone in their mind that this is going to be a long, protracted war, um, and that there are going to be many dead and wounded, there are going to be many orphaned, um, and many who uh, are widowed by this war. And that's obviously an important thing for everybody to know. Over the course of the war, it's like 600,000 people die Correct. in the Civil War. And you, we've got an image of a surgical set um, yes. that you guys have in the exhibition here, and that's tied to the battle at Wilson's Creek? It's not tied, but it's, it's, it's a USA hospital surgical kit. Mm -hmm. So this is a style that would have been used at Wilson's Creek. Um, we, unfortunately, we don't know exactly where or when this was used, except that it was used during the war and is of the style that would have been um, used at the battle. And see the mm, nature of the fine-tuned medical instruments <laughs> that we're dealing with, one of which looks uh, terribly like a hacksaw. And yes, uh, a bone saw. later in today's uh, program, you're going to see a scene that de relates to medical stuff in the Civil War that's part of the production of battle drums. So kind of visualize these instruments as you watch what's going to happen on stage in just a little bit later. Um, in addition, of course, we want to talk about the youth's involvement in the war. And we've got a Absolutely. lot of images that you've got from the exhibition that relate to that. So we're talking about kids who were drummer boys to start with, for sure, right? Absolutely. So uh, the requirement for the U.S. military, for the Union and the Confederacy, was you had to be 18 to join uh, the Army. Um, this is a period before driver's license, before Social Security cards, um, before any of these forms of identification where we can really verify ages. So a lot of young people, um, going as young as, as 11 and 12, did serve uh, and, and fight. Uh, but a lot of these younger ones, they would have joined as musicians. Mm. Um, each company uh, would have had two musicians. Um, it could have been two drummers. It could have been a drummer and a fifer, usually a drummer and a fifer. And a fife is like a, kind of like a piccolo, uh, small flute instrument. Well, let's go through some pictures because we've Absolutely. got a number of different uh, images that come from the museum, which gives the folks some chances to see uh, uniforms and all sorts of other things. So we'll bring yeah. up uh, slide four here. We can talk a little bit about this young man who we're going to see in this picture. This is uh, James Johnston, right? Yes, How old is, is this kid? He this is definitely is, a kid to me. <laughs> this is little Jimmy Johnston. He's six and a half years old when this photo is taken um, and amazingly has already been hardened by battle. You're kidding. Um, no, totally serious. Jimmy was visiting his father uh, aboard the gunboat, the Forest Rose, um, along the Mississippi River um, in what they believed was peaceful territory. He had come with his mother, um, so they were there on board the boat when it was attacked by Confederate forces. Oh. Um, so they're firing back and repel these Confederate forces. They come back the second day, again, these Confederate forces, um, and attack. Um, at this point, one of the uh, powder boys, an individual who's taking powder from the stores to the guns, is killed. Um, Jimmy 
comes from up from below deck and actually takes over that role. At six and a half years old, he, he becomes takes, the powder boy. He becomes the powder boy. Starts taking the the powder to the guns and allowing um, Union forces aboard this boat to drive back these Confederates. And we've got a um, picture of his day. uniform, I believe. We do. This so, is actually the uniform that he wore at that point in time? No. So is it a different kind of uniform? What's this? This is after the battle. Okay. All, everyone on board has dubbed him Admiral Jimmy <laughs> um, in honor of his gallantry. Um, and so they've made him this uniform. Um, and it's complete with uh, quartermaster insignia. It's, uh, it's a real live uh, naval uniform made for a six and a half year old. Oh, very cool. We're, we're starting to get some email questions coming into the okay. program. So I'm gonna go through a couple of more slides and we'll, and we'll deal with some of those email questions because I know we've got more in terms of uniforms. This is another young man, George, how am I pronouncing his name, Mepham? Mepham, yeah. Mepham. And that'll, that'll come up and we'll see him. And, yeah. And, 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 and how do, I see he's like, that's obviously an encampment, the picture is of him in an encampment. Yeah, so this is, this is a, a picture that was commissioned by his parents. Uh, mm -hmm. He actually, was not in conflict, but it, his interest in the military kind of reflects how this war is changing, um, even the way that youngsters played. Uh, he actually is wearing uh, his Zouave uniform, which is modeled after uh, the French who were fighting in North Africa. Um, but many U.S. military units were also wearing these style of uniforms. Um, one of them visited St. Louis in the summer of 1860, and it's likely that he was inspired um, oh, wow. to be interested in that by... Uh, by seeing those people come and, and uh, show their skills, their military prowess. One of the email questions we've got relates to pay. You may or may not know this. Did these young boys get paid wages for they being? They did, they did, and, and pay varied, but uh, in some cases I've read uh, as high as uh, getting paid $13 a month for their services. Oh. And in addition to that, they were actually, upon enlistment, sometimes their parents were given money um, uh, in some cases, as high as three hundred dollars for, for their service. Were there situations then of parents actually? I hate to use the word selling, but you know, were there those kinds of situations where a family would, for, for money purposes, say, "My kid's available." Certainly, yeah, that okay. would have happened. But you, there was also many cases of drummer boys being um, extremely excited to join. Um, they were looking to, without knowing the agony of war, excited to escape kind of the drudgery of school and daily life on the farm and things like that. Um, so certainly some were forced into service by their parents, but uh, uh, a lot of them joined uh, of their own volition. And the next image we've got is of Private Elijah Madison, um, who was yes. in the 68th Regiment? Yes, the United States Colored Troops. So he uh -huh. was an African American. Uh, he was actually enslaved in what is modern day St. Louis County. Um, so he was, uh, he escaped in 1864. He came to Benton Barracks, which was in the St. Louis area. Um, and he joined uh, the Union Army. Um, initially, it was a Missouri unit. Eventually, it became the 68th United States uh, Colored Troops, and they served uh, throughout the South, uh, in Mississippi, in Louisiana, and in other places. And that's an important image we wanted you to see because the people of color are going to be important to this program we're talking about, to the play, and the interaction that they have with people. And so yes. um, were the colored regiments, as they were known at the time, were they part of what was happening at the very beginning of the war, or did they come at a later point? That's a good question. Um, they were not. Lincoln had uh, a vision for the war as being about preserving the Union. And he was concerned that border states like Missouri, um, like Kentucky, like Maryland, uh, would not put up with uh, any interference with slavery and uh, recruiting African American troops uh, would have been seen as doing that. Now, African Americans did come to Union camps. Uh, they did serve as laborers. Um, but it wasn't until 1863 that they began to be recruited in earnest. Um, by the Union Army. Oh, wow. There's those dings. I love hearing those dings. That means yeah. email questions are actually coming in, and Birdville is joining us with questions via that method. Did, um, oh, this is kind of interesting. Um, were there veterans' benefits available to these people after the war, or did that kind of system even exist at the Civil War time period? That's a good question. So, for African American troops, is that? Uh huh. Yes, so they would have received pensions. Um, it's interesting. They would have received pensions, but those who had fought for the Confederacy would not because they would not have received uh, pensions from a government that no mm -hmm. longer existed. Oh, but African-American troops did receive pensions. Well, Daniel, thanks so much for joining Absolutely. us. Absolutely, thanks if for having me. If we get more me. email questions during the program, I'm gonna bring you back up at the end as well. Sure. Major hours here at the museum. If you're in the St. Louis area, you wanna to come to the Missouri History Museum. The exhibition's here for a long time, and what are your operating hours? Um, we're, gonna, we're open nine to five most days. On Tuesdays, we're open late. Um, and on Saturdays and Sundays, we're open as well. And it's a fabulous facility. Daniel, thanks so much for Thank joining you. us. We're glad to have a chance to highlight the exhibition. Our pleasure. Great.
So there you get some historic context. And so obviously in that context, youth are involved in the war. And so Carol North, the director of, of the production and the artistic director of Metro Theater Company, has decided to take on this story, so to speak, with the production of Battle Drum that they're doing. Carol, thanks Hi, so Tim. much for being here. A pleasure, always. Always a pleasure. So let's talk about the nature of the historic context moving to the dramatic context as we look at this set here. Yes. The play Battle Drum takes these kids who are like 10 and 12 years old mm -hmm. and puts them right into war, right? That's right, right into the eye of the war. In fact, the play begins with the destruction of a family farm and a, a southern farm. And the boy whose uh, parents are lost in the fire is an orphan. And the, the Union soldiers who have burned down his farm are whooping it up, having a great time, and he's, he has nowhere to go. So he ends up tagging along with the Union army. Uh, the, the Union drummer boy, thinks he's a prisoner, of course, and resents the heck out of him. But uh, for Rufus, the, the southern boy, you know, it's a place where he can be fed, where he's got some sense of protection. Not well, shelter, but protection. What about this play intrigued you? Why this play? Why, why is it something yeah. better that kind of made you interested? It's a terrific play. It's got well-drawn characters that we care about right from the beginning. Um, it, it's based on, on truth, certainly, and there's so much action in it. It's just exciting beginning to end. It, it grabbed my attention. It moved me deeply. Um, it, it's, it's well written. And, and it's not just a play. There's music involved right. as well. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a strange thing to think about a Civil War play that's a musical. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a musical like Hello, Dolly, heaven knows, but it has songs that advance the action, that really kind of open the hearts of the characters to us. And it has Civil War drums at the center of it because this play is focusing on the Civil War from the perspective of children. And uh, the Union drummer boy, of course, has his drum. It's a coveted, prized possession that he's the keeper of. Uh, he's none too eager to have this Southern kid learn how mm -hmm. to handle it, but that's what he's told to do. And so he does it. Oh, well, in a way. <laughs> in a way. <laughs> in a way. And did the actors know how to drum? Was that part of the, uh, oh, in order to be in this perform this play, you're going to have to know how to drum, or have they learned the process in res oh, rehearsal? Oh, Tim, have they ever worked hard? <laughs> in casting the play, I certainly worked with people who um, had some musical chops, mm -hmm. but none of them is a percussionist. <laughs> <laughs> so I went for help um, and found my way to a remarkable St. Louisan named Terry Artis, whom you're going to talk to later. And Terry taught these five actors what it is to drum and to drum well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's talk a, a little bit rigorous about, taskmaster. Let's talk a little bit about the set, if you yeah. want to. We'll move up this a little, yeah. a, a little ways here sure. and look at these. We're dealing with a series of platforms. We've obviously got flags in the background to represent both Union and Confederate armies. Are we caring that it's a specific location, or is it just the idea that they're moving from place to place? Yeah. It's kind of like... Yeah, that's central, Tim, because okay. this is an infantry unit. Mm -hmm. They don't have horses, they don't have wagons, they don't have uh, uh, buildings of any sort. They're always on the move. So the set had to um, take us to many different places, to any place. As I said, it begins with the destruction of a family farm. And this is not uh, moving down a road, you know. <laughs> These infantry were moving over the terrain, whatever it was, rocky, hill. Um, and so we wanted a set that gave the actors something physical to work with and work on. Mm -hmm. um, set designer Nicholas Crea designed a space specifically for the History Museum stage that has ramps and levels and platforms um, so we can work not only with the sense of terrain but also with high ground. You know, who's more important than someone else? Oh. Working with levels is one way that we work with status and power in uh -huh. the theater, too. Oh, that's very interesting. Birdville, thank you for your email question that's come in. They're interested in knowing, did you look at other Civil War plays in the process of determining this one? Or is this, did you look at this play? I would also add to that, did you look at this play because it was a Civil War play, or were you already intrigued mm -hmm. by that? Or It's funny how plays come your way. Uh -huh. You know, actually this was sent to me shortly mm -hmm. after its premiere. Uh, Metro Theater Company is producing Battle Drum, um, just the second professional production. And the uh, director of that original piece, who commissioned the play from Doug Cooney, sent it to me. Um, I had met Doug Cooney before, and we struck up a correspondence. But you know, I get lots of scripts in the mail. And um, I glance at them, and some just keep moving. <laughs> you know? But this one was so well written. I wasn't looking for a Civil War play. This play came to me, and I said, someday. We have to produce this. Oh, very cool. Well, yeah. we're going to see some scenes. And one of the things, obviously, you're a company for 
children in the sense that you do performance, you do theater for young adults for children, but the actors themselves aren't necessarily children. No, they're professional actors. So talk a little bit about the process of that so the audience has an idea about that in terms of like adults acting as children. I mean, and, and, and the nature of this play specifically, I mean, this is kind of heavy subject matter. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to be dealing with like middle school kids, upper elementary age kids. Uh, what were your thoughts in terms of picking this kind of subject matter for that kind of student? And then what's your thought about using adults for kids' roles? Yeah, that's a great big question, Tim. But um, part of what I want to say is that every play that Metro Theatre Company does uh, is selected or developed specifically to respect kids wherever they are. And, and I think uh, a lot of kids are sold short mm -hmm. by plays that are created for them. Um, inadvertently, some plays talk down to kids. I don't think artists mean to do that, but it happens. What this play does, I think, is invite young people and adults into a very compelling story. And it's a story for all of us. It's a story of our past. So I wanted actors who were going to give that full emotional integrity and skill. Um, the, the actors play multiple roles. Most of them do. Uh, I needed versatile actors. I needed actors who could go to the depths of the emotional truth of this story. And I think that in the theater, just like this set is not a realistic landscape, the audience knows how to take that journey with us. Um, what we do in the theater is we invite audiences to imagine with us. And the actors are so terrific in their roles. They've really looked at the personal truth of an emotional moment. They've found that connection in their own hearts. And it comes alive. Uh, so it doesn't matter that they may be in their 20s. You know, I think when a story is well told, almost anyone can be the storyteller. Well, let's start telling the story a little bit. We'll yeah. talk about this first scene here. Anything you want the audience to know in terms of who the characters are they're going to see or the setup for this scene? Yeah. Uh, we're going to meet the three young boys, Rufus, who is uh, the southern boy who's tagged along with the Union Army, Jackson, who is the drummer boy, the first drummer boy with the division, and a newcomer, um, George Washington is his name. He's a runaway slave who's making his way north on the Underground Railroad. He has just sort of stumbled into the camp. And as the three boys are getting to know each other a little bit, um, their commanding officer, Corporal Wilkes, observes some kind of fearsome drumming. And he has called the three boys into his tent. They think they're in trouble. Mm. That's how it begins. Well, let's run the scene then. We'll move out of the way and we'll give you a little bit of excerpt from Battle Drum. Yeah. Well, the food's not good, but it's food. Uh, we could transfer you to a regiment headed north, but you earn your keep in the army, and I expect we'll keep you drumming. Fifth Division, Fourth Regiment, Third Platoon, Third Drummer Boy, on reserve. Don't want a drum, sir. But I already heard you drum. I don't want to be a drummer, boy. I can't fight no man's battles. That's what I believe. That's how I was raised. <laughs> Well, if you, if you won't drum, what good are you? I can read. You cannot. I said I can read. I can read. You can read? I taught myself, sir. How'd you teach yourself how to read, Mr. Washington? I was slave to the new little master. He was four and I was six, come time to learn reading and writing, and I was right beside him. But black with a book in your hands, you get a licking with red pepper and salt rubbed in the wounds to learn you good. So I wait till night and light a pine torch and get a hold of that Webster's blueback speller, teach myself under the blanket. <laughs> Very resourceful, Mr. Washington. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Well, now prove it. Let me hear you read. Read what? I got this letter. Uh, it was in the jacket, sir. Uh, it's a love letter. Uh, we shouldn't have, sir. I know. Oh. That's all right, Mr. Jackson. We take our comfort where we find it. Read the letter, Mr. Washington. From the beginning? Mm. Dearest Amanda, I witnessed a painful sight this week. The shooting of two... Well, that's incredible... not the letter. That's what it says. No, sir, it starts, my precious only Let darling. Let see the letter. Dearest Amanda, that's what it says. Keep reading, Mr. Washington. I witnessed a painful sight this week. The shooting of two federal soldiers tried for desertion. Desertion? And what's that? Running away because you quit, because you're yellow. Or scared? Want no part of it. They run. Dishonor. 
found guilty of desertion and sentenced to be shot. Or shot? They kill you for it? Kill you dead. Infantry marched in formation surrounding the prisoners. Eight men shouldered two empty coffins waiting for the execution. No, th that's not what the letter says. That letter's a love letter from her to him and all about love. Uh, Jackson read it to me. I made up what I read, sir. I don't know how to read. I see. Mr. Washington, how's your penmanship? Uh, my mama always said I write like a girl. <laughs> I think you'll do just fine. My secretary is bound to read my correspondence and write my replies. Can you do that? Yes, sir. There you go. Secretary and third drummer boy on reserve. But, sir. You I like this elephant, Mr. Washington? Yes, sir. I made it myself. Here, keep it. Thank you, sir. You men are dismissed. Good night. We're gonna have a chance for everybody to now meet the actors and talk a little bit about this scene as well. So I'm gonna start, Nick, why don't you just join me on my left side so we don't spread out quite so much. <laughs> and we'll begin with the process of just everybody introducing themselves. Nick, start. Um, my name is uh, Nicholas Crea, and uh, I've been with Metro for many years. I'm glad to be here today. And in addition to acting in the play, I think Carol mentioned a little thing about set design? Oh uh, yes, I'm the designer for this set, so. So yes. if you guys have questions about the set design, Nick is the man to ask them as well. Sir, nice to meet you. Introduce Hi yourself to everybody. Uh, my name is Robert Moore. Um, I'm originally from Memphis, Tennessee. I actually went to school here in St. Louis, though. I went to Webster University, cool. and now I'm an actor. All right, Robert, thanks for being with us. And? I'm Pat Mullen. I'm playing Rufus. Uh, I'm here from Indianapolis. <laughs> and at the far end, Mark Holzem. Uh, I'm playing Jackson. I'm, I'm, from St. I'm from St. Louis. All right, very cool. Gentlemen, I'm going to get you for some questions, but Nick, I want to talk to you a little bit first because sure. I know you've got to switch out yeah. and get some other stuff done as well. So you're Corporal Wilkes. Right. Talk a little bit about who he is in the play and what you do to like think in terms of being, I mean, you've done a lot of different performances for Metro Theater over the yeah. years. So what about this character makes him interesting? What's the kind of dramatic thread you're going for? Um, Colonel Wilkes is really um, kind of the father figure for these boys. Um, he, he's, he has to be, maintain the discipline uh, of the military life, but at the same time, he is like uh, the father in absentia, you know, mm -hmm. he has to take care of them and encourage them. And he knows full well that, that, that they risk their lives every time they get out in front uh, because the enemy will, will try to knock them off to mess up the communication. Um, and good leaders such as Corporal Wilkes and other guys also in the Civil War were also right at the front lines you know, to inspire the troops to keep moving. So in some ways we share a kind of a, a father-son bond that we're standing up in front and saying, do your best, mm -hmm. follow us, you know, so. And they do it. Yeah. Because they really don't yeah. have any other choice. No, no. Let's talk about the set a little bit. Sure. Because I love the way it looks <laughs> and what it, it represents. Put us in your mind. You've read the script. Where did this idea come from? Um, the first thing that I wanted to do was to create the sense uh, in Kentucky, where the play takes place, of the hills. And so I wanted sky and some kind of ridge. So in order to create that, I knew that I was going to use some platforms, and I wanted to make it irregular. Um, and and uh, I thought that if I tried to make it look realistic on stage, mm -hmm. that it would look kind of fake. So I tried to create um, an abstracted place with lots of different levels so we could be high, low, and it would be interesting geometrically and would expose a lot of sky behind. Um, throw a little fence off to one side to kind of anchor it in the Civil War and, that, and, and a rural place. Um, but for the longest time, I didn't know what to do with the open sky. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew that the theater here, um, in the History Museum that the sky was very close to the set. Yeah. So I had to put something in between to kind of to, 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 to make it work. Uh, and it just came to me one day, I thought, oh, well, why don't I just do it symbolically? I, 
uh, like the drums. Just make it these two flags, uh -huh. you know, and this, that'll feed the abstract and let the actors be the realistic part of the set. You know, so. And what's the process with you and the director as the set design comes together? I mean, is it like, <laughs> this is my idea and Carol, you're going to love it? Or what's the, what's the give and take of that process? Well, we talk from the very beginning on, uh, uh, and we also, we've worked so many times together that we share a, a kind of aesthetic that less is more, and in the theater, using your imagination is what we strive for because that's what live theater can do. Um, so I did a number of different drawings of different stage arrangements and that sort of thing, and we started there, we looked at them, and she said, oh, I like this, I like this part of this one, don't ever do that again, you know, those kinds of things. And, that, and, that, and this is helpful to know this information because you can go down a, an alley for a long time if somebody isn't firm enough to say, no. Mm. Um, and so there's a lot of give and take. And, and eventually then, because I built the set too, there's a little bit of uh, flux mm -hmm. in, in, in putting it together. Um, but we were out here before the show today working on these flags back here, trying to get them trimmed just right and get them to look just right. So we're still working on that. So. Well, yeah, it come looks, back. It looks fantastic. Before I let you go, I want to go to one of the email questions that's come specifically for you. Did you do any kind of research into the Civil War at all to think in terms of either your character or set design? Um, I did a lot of research in terms of my character, just in terms of the military life uh, and uh, the kind of uh, heartaches that these guys went through. Um, and I read a couple of novels over the past two years that had to do with the Civil War. Um, in terms of research for the play, the set itself, I filled my brain with visual images, um, mostly of, of scenes that I knew were in the show, roads, and the results of battle at Gettysburg mm -hmm. and Vicksburg, the ruins, the, the burned down house, the, the falling apart wall, those sort of things. We wanted a sense of tattered, ruined, kind of burned out look. So. That's a lot of research with that. Filled it up here and then just let it one go around, you know. <laughs> Nick, thanks so much. I'll let you go and I'll talk to these three guys. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you for waiting so kindly. Don't forget you can send us your email questions to live at hectv.org. That's live at hectv.org. We've obviously gotten a whole bunch so far, so we'll be getting more. In the first one, actually, we got applies to your character. Oh, yeah. And it's very specific in relationship to the scene we just saw. Why don't you want to drum? Um, I don't want to drum. I well, the previous action for this scene is that uh, I've been on the run, and this is all happening so fast, and I don't want to... I'm aware of what's going on. My character's kind of intelligent, so I don't... I just don't want to take any part of, of this war, this battle. I just want to escape, you know, to freedom. And we learn about your character through, through the play and, and, and your story, the, character, the story of George Washington. You've been, spent some time on the Underground Railroad, which has gotten you to this point. Yes, it actually was not a successful trip. Um, I was with a group, and we were crossing a river, um, and the rowboat we were on turned over, mm -hmm. and that's when I became separated and on my own. That's when I ran into these guys in the woods. I want to ask a question of Rufus as we talk a little bit about yes. costumes because we got an email question about the different costumes. Talk specifically about the coat that you're wearing <laughs> and just the nature of how getting into the costume makes a difference for you as an actor getting into character. Yeah, it, uh, it, it can make a huge difference. Um, in fact, this, uh, this is only the second day I've actually ever started working with this coat. Um, but uh, yeah, you really you make a lot of discoveries with um, your costume. Uh, there's, a point in the show where Rufus is very vulner vulnerable and I've started to learn that um, there's a lot I can do with really pulling this around me and the way it feels keeping me safe and of course um, it's halfway through the show it's getting further in the year it's getting colder and there's that sudden warmth that that changes uh, how my character behaves a little bit physically too um, obviously. And Jackson, we'll ask a similar question of you as we look at yours, because you're, you're very, very differently dressed, right. so it gives us the sense of some kind of uniform, but not obviously accuracy in terms of uniform. Talk a little bit about what you're wearing and what it makes you feel like. Uh, well, as Jackson, uh, he takes a lot of pride in being the drummer boy. It's his, it's his level of importance, and he makes sure to let Rufus know that all the time. Uh, and so as, Ru as Jackson, I feel... Um, very tight, and I always have my sticks with me, always very important. Uh, and the hat, well, he was talking about vulnerability in the coat, kind of like doing one of these things. The uniform and the hat are all just like, like an armor to kind of keep the fear away and whatever, because I mean, as kids, like, this fear has just got to be immense. Um, so, I mean, putting on this uniform, it's, it's like growing up, kind of. 
Very cool. We've had a, an email question multiple sure. times and that either one of you can talk about this in terms of making your living through acting. So <laughs> talk a little bit about maybe what brought you into acting and is this like something you do a lot of? What, do you, what else do you do besides that? I'll let each three of you talk about it. We'll start down there with good old okay. Jackson. Um, <laughs> uh, I've, I started acting when I was like 14. Um, I, didn't, I didn't really think of it as a career. Uh, and then I started doing a bunch of it in high school and it kind of, it, it, being able to tell a story and it affect people in ways um, through all sorts, just, just through words and just through realistic acting on stage was, uh, inspired me. And so then I'm actually still in college right now uh, I graduated in May from SLU, from St. Louis University, um, with a degree in theater and philosophy. Um, well, there's a fascinating combination. Yeah, right? <laughs> I like it. Um, Lots of employment opportunities for anyone who's interested. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, seeing as a profession uh -huh. and working with just the lovely people at Metro and what they've done to create such a great experience, it's, it's, it's awesome. Rufus? <laughs> Uh, yeah, ma making a living in theater is, is interesting, and I'm just kind of uh, starting out actually with, with all that. I've been acting since I was um, seven, uh, and uh, somewhere along the line I decided it's something I wanted to do professionally, and I've been uh, trying to just audition as much as I can. And uh, <laughs> But, you know, it can be a little unstable mm -hmm. sometimes. You don't always know exactly. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what I'm doing after this yet. <laughs> <laughs> hint, hint, Carol. Um, and, and, and George Washington? Um, I too have been acting since uh, 14, like high school. I did some plays. Then I ended up uh, going to the Webster Conservatory, and that's when it really became like a serious thing for me. I realized, you know, this is a career. You know, I can do this. It is difficult, um, but it requires a lot of persistence, um, a lot of drive, you know, and, and heart and passion behind what you're doing. But I enjoy it, and um, you know, we're about to open this show, and I'm lo really looking forward to that. It's been a lot of fun. It's fun to me creating characters mm -hmm. and building and, um, you, I don't know, I love growing as an artist. Very cool. Well, we're going to get the opportunity to see these characters in a different scene now. We're going to be joined by another character known as General Cutter. I won't tell you more than that because I think the scene to a large extent speaks for itself. So gentlemen, I'll exit. Let General Cutter join you and we'll move as necessary. <laughs> Dead man. General Cutter? Hush. Speak up. Who's it going to be? Which one weighs the most? Uh, me? Bang, you're dead. On the stretcher, you two, move. Um. On three, <clears throat> lift. One, two, three. Yeah. Look what happens. We're raising the dead. Put him down. Ow. Enough out of you. <sighs> Rest in <clears throat> peace. What did we learn? If they're alive, put them down gentle. If they're not, not. Let's try walking. One, two, three, lift. Three steps towards the river. And three steps towards the hills. Why don't we put him down? Well, that depends on whether he's alive or dead. How are you feeling, soldier? Dead or alive? I thought I was dead. I'm giving you a choice. I want to live. He's alive. Bring him to the tent. Let us work miracles. Do you boys understand what you have to do? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Uh, Ma'am, sir, uh, General. Uh... I know what the soldiers call me. General Cutter. You're afraid to say it to my face. You boys know how I got that name? Don't answer. I'll tell you how. Because we all have a difficult job. And we all have to do it. Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes, sir. That's the answer? Hush. You! Take this stretcher back to the field hospital. Uh, but, sir, uh, ma'am, I can't leave my drum. Take your bed and walk. Leave your drum right there. But I'm supposed to stay ready Who in case... Who is your superior officer right here, right now? Yes, sir. General Cutter. Very much. I'll have you. I'll invite you all to come downstairs, downstage. Uh, well, I guess it's kind of stairs it's too. <laughs> Susan, why don't you join me on the left? Because the folks on my left, ah, yes. since the folks haven't had a chance to meet you yet, and let's start with an introduction of you. Hi, Susan. Hi. Let everybody know your name and how did you come to this uh, play? 
Okay. Well, my name is Susan Rash. I'm so happy to be here. And um, I got a call from, um, from Carol North to take a look at the script and uh, just read it and, and see if I might be interested in doing it. Um, it, was, uh, it really intrigued me, um, not only for the storyline and the way that um, it challenges young audiences to look at war and uh, what drummer boys were, but also the opportunity to play so many different characters, which I do throughout mm -hmm. the play, and I enjoy that a lot. And that's actually a question, perfect, thank you for that segue, because oh, that's a question I wanted to ask you about the nature of acting versus reacting, and that how people think about that, because it's all one thing, you're doing both. But in that first scene we see, you're a stationary object to a large extent responding a great deal. Talk a little bit about just how you approach that, and is it different in your approach than in a scene where you're like so involved, let's say? That's a great question, and honestly, I would say no, it's not any different, because um, acting is all about listening. You know, certainly there's a different kind of work when you have to learn lines in a scene and be responsible for those and really drive a scene the way that the, the character of General Cutter does in that scene that we just saw. But an actor's job is always to listen and react honestly to what's happening. So in that sense, it's all the same. Very cool. We've had some email questions. The first one, I'll stick with you, Susan. Were there really women like this in the Civil War? There were. And in fact, I believe they were called Angels of Mercy. Mm -hmm which is interesting because um, the characters in this play express a lot of fear over meeting General Cutter, the nurse, um, and going to the tent or being, of course, wounded. But, um, but they were there to help, and it was very uh, difficult work that they did. Um, so, so yes, there were women, to this answer is, your question. I, I'm hoping I remember my history right. This is the whole Clara Barton time frame, if I'm remembering correctly. I think, and if not, somebody's going to look that up online and, and email me real fast to say, no, Tim, you're wrong. You've forgotten your history. Gentlemen, I want to go to you guys because this was a different scene as well for you physically. <laughs> First and foremost, the email question came in, is he really heavy? <laughs> oh, it's not. He's not too bad. <laughs> okay. So, 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 so talk, he's not too bad. Interesting response. Um, so talk a little bit then about the nature of working with that physical prop and making sure it looks like he's a little bit heavy because you yeah. seem to be struggling a little bit as you move him around. Yeah, and well, the other thing too that uh, you have to remember um, as we're as we're working with that is that you know we're we're obviously I'm 20 and you know it's it's not too hard to pick up Mark, uh, carry him around if I need to, but uh, my character is supposed to be 10 years old, which you have a lot less physical strength then, uh, so you know you have to make sure you can show that struggle and. It's acting. Yeah. <laughs> That's acting. why they call it acting. Yeah. Well, yeah. speaking of acting, the question is, is for your character on sure. the trust factor involved in they're going to drop me. <laughs> so talk a little bit about that. I think it's a really cool question well, that I'm came in. I'm always very catch yeah. mark, if anything. Oh, sure. remember that. So, you know, <laughs> drop did you guys actually time. rehearse, this is the way we're going to do the drop in the same way that you would rehearse like a sword fight scene or whatever? Correct. Oh, yeah. uh, we always do. Uh, in the scene, too, there's, there's a bit of a, we have a tussle, too, mm -hmm. and that we have like a fight call. So we go over all the things that are very physical and that could potentially be dangerous to everyone. Uh, but yeah, we, we just 100% trust in, in, in everyone in this show. Um, yes, yes, yes. Right, That's right. the right public attitude to have. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, we've got more questions, but I want to make sure that we get to Terry Artis so we can talk about the drums. I know you guys have to switch out a little bit so you can get your drums ready for what we're going to do in our next segment. Sure. So thanks very much. I'll let you guys exit stage left or right, whatever floats your boat. <laughs> and I'll invite Terry Artis to join us at this point in time. Susan, go sure. right ahead. Thanks, thanks everybody. Much. We're here with Terry Artis, the director of Show Me Sound. Terry, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me, Tim. Well, first and foremost, let everybody understand what Show Me Sound is all about. Show Me Sound is a musical youth organization focusing on percussive arts for students in the city of St. Louis and the county of St. Louis, serving children from 10 years old to 17 or 18 when they graduate high school. And you've been doing this for a lengthy period of time now? 18 years. Wow. What got you interested in it? Um, I was a percussionist throughout my high school years and in college, so um, I wanted to give back to the community, help some children to discover themselves through the percussive arts, and that's what got me wanting to start an organization and do it. Oh, very cool. Well, how did you get connected with Carol North and the Metro Theater folks? Carol gave me a call. Uh -huh. I didn't know Carol prior to that, but um, she had given me a call and said, I have this interesting project, has some drums in it, Civil War, mm -hmm. rope drums, and you know, I'd be interested in having you. I've seen some of your videos, I've heard about you, and you know, I hadn't met her, but I had heard a lot about Metro Theater and the work you did with children. So uh, 
I said, sure, I'll, I'll entertain it. She sent me a script and everything. It was very interesting, the music uh -huh. and the ideas that she had for it. We sat down and talked, and I said, absolutely. We're going to talk a little bit about the nature of the drum, because I think that might be sure. important as we begin to talk about techniques. But I want us to bring up a slide of an actual Civil War drummer boy drum that is uh, here in the m exhibition at uh, the History Museum. You see it there, so you get a sense of its size and its dimensions. And the replica ones that the actors are working with are similar in size and dimension and nature. And as we look at that picture, let's just talk about the parts of the drum and what they do for things. Those ropes yes. and stuff on the outside matter, right? Absolutely. The ropes are the tension rods of the drum are. They are what creates the tension for the top head and the bottom head. And the uh, slide, the uh, leather slides push downward uh, and it pulls those ropes closer together as you see the triangular uh, uh, rope tension in the bottom. As you slide them down, it gets tighter, makes the heads tighter on top and bottom. Very cool. Now, when you begin to train people to work on drums, and these actors obviously did not know drumming is my understanding. No, they didn't. So how do you begin? I mean, is, are there certain ways I need to hold the sticks? Absolutely. All of it begins from the beginning. It's just like teaching percussive students. You begin with the proper grip, how to maintain or how to establish and maintain the proper grip. And then you talk about the types of strokes that you use. You talk about playing from the wrist. You talk about using the fingers. It's the whole lesson from the beginning. Now, That's what they got. In the Civil War, obviously, and even later wars, the drums were exceptionally important on the battlefield. There were different cadences sure. that meant different kinds of directions. Right. Did you already know that kind of information, or did you have to do some research yourself? Had to do some research. And uh, with the battle drum comes the different commands and the different rhythms that go with those commands. And they are the actual rhythms, I believe, from the Civil War, what they used. I How did you find were. them? Well, it was these rudiments have been out forever. These are the same commands that have been used traditionally mm -hmm. in drumming. So it, it, rudiments don't change. And so the audience knows actually there's actual moments during the play where they, they're, they're testing the drummer boy, so to speak. Yeah. And they're actually saying like, you know, I don't know. Left flank. Left flank or whatever the case and may be. And he has to play and the rhythm that goes with the And like flank. retreat or reveille or breakfast sure. call or go to sleep or whatever. They're all different. And so the, the drum was important because the sound could travel, I guess, almost endlessly across the battlefield. Correct. And so we've got the deal with the, the, the war sounds that are happening anyway because there would be gunshot potentially and cannon shot. And then in the middle of that, ideally speaking, they're going to hear a drum. Right, right. And, so, and they could distinguish the sound of the drum. And when you hear the drum, you'll know that it has a distinct sound. And even over the cannons and the guns, uh -huh. there is a distinct sound that is attributed to the drum. So in the chaos of war, the drum still comes You through. can still hear. I'm getting good email dings. Thank you all very much. Don't forget it's live at HECTV.org. That's live at HECTV.org. Well, this is an interesting question that'll take us into the example of, as we start to work with the actors here and let them show some folks, examples of the drumming. Do you see any kind of line between what drummer boys were doing or the use of the drum in, in, mili in, mil in military times and what you have now with like drum lines? Uh, yes. Uh, like I said, the rudiments haven't changed. All of these things are the same. The basic rudiments of drumming, the paradiddles, the uh, flams, the rolls, it's all the same. Uh -huh. It's still used, the exact same rudiments. Wow. Well, let's so, bring but it's just used with different rhythms and different melodies and harmonies. Cool. Let's bring the actors out. Actors, here's your cue. <laughs> and I guess, you know, let's just line ourselves up. At, up uh, you know, some, yeah, Somewhere. let's go across this part if we can, I guess. I under different levels is fine. You don't have to be necessarily be in a straight line. Different yeah. levels is good. And first and foremost, Susan, why don't you join us over on this side? And Nick, I'll let you take the, take the rear. Take up the rear, Nick. It will be great up there on that height. And I, first and foremost, I want to just ask you guys about your drum and the nature of a relationship to it. So Susan, is the first, is this, in this play, is this the first time you've dealt with a drum, holding it this way, what's it like, that kind of thing? You're working on the play? Uh-huh. Yes, absolutely. And um, I've done, you know, some percussion before for other plays. Um, and my favorite, the steering wheel drumming when I'm driving in the car. Mm -hmm. But to learn how to do this left-handed technique and just really traditional drumming was so different and really exciting. Okay, very cool. Now, I noticed that your drum is a little larger. Yes. And so is there any kind of significance to that? Or There is. Uh, okay. This drum has a specific name, and uh, Mark uh, can probably tell you a little bit more about that because Mark actually has this drum through most of the show. This drum is o Obadiah. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, I only pick it up at the end. Mark, talk a little bit about it. Uh, yeah, it's like the main symbol throughout the show. It's called Obadiah, and there's a long, I have a long speech about it. So, you know, it's a prophet, you know, Obadiah the prophet prophesying destruction. 
And I say it's the thunder before the storm, but kind of it is. You know, I give the commands to shoot. I give the commands to. Uh, so it's kind of it's kind of my baby. You know? Now, and Terry, I'm assuming that based on the size, etc., they're going to sound a little different. Yeah. Yeah, for the most part, they do have different depths and different sounds and pitch. Well, give us a, give us a mini lesson, so to speak. If we were going to start, what's the first thing you're going to tell us about holding the sticks? Oh, uh, the first thing is naturally when a person picks up drumsticks, they pick them up in what's called match grip, where both hands look the same. Go right ahead and do that. Thanks, guys. Okay. So that's the normal way for everybody to pick up sticks. Okay. The drums in the Civil War period leaned. The rope drums, they had a strap and they leaned because they were hung from a strap on uh -huh. one shoulder. Because of that, it was difficult to play match grip across the lean. So they developed traditional grip for the left hand, an underhanded grip so they could play over the lean with the left hand and the right hand stayed in match. Oh, well that so, would be totally different than what you're expecting to do, I'm assuming. Uh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> for sure, so um, simple thing to learn or you're like, oh my gosh, this is going to take me way longer than, the run of the show will be over before I feel good about it. Uh, <laughs> right. Well, we have gotten much better since uh, we've been rehearsing so intensely. <laughs> but um, the first time, the first day when I, when I came in to pick it up, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh -huh. I can't read these 16th notes and my arm hurts. But um, <laughs> it's gotten better. It's gotten a lot better. Um, you know, it's becoming second nature. Just like anything, you got to practice. Well, let's start with just, let's hear each sound, each drum, and then Terry will have us do a couple of examples of calls. Sure. So, uh, Nick, let's start with you. What's your drum sound like? Mark? We come over here to George Washington's character. Don't worry, Ob Obadiah's going to be in. Susan? And Obadiah? Very nice. So now, Terry, let's call, what, what's an example of a call that comes out in the play? Well. Uh, we do some exercises. Uh -huh. There is a uh, feature in the play. Everyone does individual calls, uh -huh. but they don't do a call all together. We yes. do some exercises to put ourselves into the playing perspective. You want to go for that? Sure. Okay. Shall we do a uh, hand speed exercise all together? Nice and Ooh, easy. hand speed exercise. Okay, gentlemen okay. and lady. <laughs> One and two and ready and go and. Nick, you're not looking down at the drum, I noticed. You're looking forward. Talk a little bit about that. What was it like to be able to move from, you know, how, well, what was that like? <laughs> I don't know what it was like for the drummer boys in the, in the Civil War looking forward to go, but, but I certainly, knowing the drum line and working with Terry, that that's the way you do it. Uh -huh. that, this, that you're really, you're forward, ongoing with it. You're, everything is really crisp and clear. There's trying to find these right rest positions and that sort of thing. But you can imagine in a, in, a, in a battle if the boys were going straight out looking at the opposing army coming right at them. Wow. Whoa. Terry, what else would you like to give us a demonstration of? Uh, let's do uh, what we call today. It warms up the uh, double stroke and triple stroke methods of drumming. Okay. Okay. So let's do that from the top. Ready? Two. Ta da ta go and I mean, man, the way that feels in your chest is absolutely amazing. And you just started playing a couple months ago? Uh, I guess, let's see, we started on November 28th was my first day drumming. Wow. Well done, to say the least. <laughs> well, well, well done. done yeah. Susan, we've gotten some email questions about, so you know what this drum is like. 
So you're a 10 year old boy. What do you think it would have been like for a 10 year old boy to car carry something like this? It's heavy, it's weight. Well, because I'm not very tall, uh -huh. I can probably imagine pretty well what it was like. And I have to say that um, the weight does get to me after a while. I mean, I'm a pretty strong person, but um, it's certainly, it certainly is something that you have to get used to and also getting the strap adjusted properly because I don't have as much room from the top of my head to my waist as some of the guys have. Uh -huh. So it is a different sort of, um, tech, not technique, but um, experience for me to, to play in the amount of space I have. And, but it's just like getting used to everything else because this was totally new for me. Very cool. <laughs> I'll invite Carol to join us uh, to, as we get close to the end. But Terry, as Carol comes up, I also, we've gotten some questions about the, the, these cadences. During the actual war itself, were these things just passed down from drummer boy to drummer boy? Was there kind of like a, a set training method or anything like that? Actually, what it is, we're doing all the same things and as far as training methods. There are trainings on single hand, uh, single notes. Uh -huh. There are training on double strokes and triple strokes. Everyone does a different one. These are the ones that I use, uh -huh. but there was always a method of training that someone used to teach those ideals. Oh, very cool. Carol, come and join me on this mm -hmm. side. Sure. Uh, talk a little bit about, okay, you meet this guy, this is, how does it all come together and what does it matter, how does it make a difference, I think, from the perspective of actors and the whole scene coming to life and the play coming to life, that you are able to actually do the work correctly, so to speak? It's everything. Mm -hmm. It's everything. I mean, this is a play and, and it's, it's theatrical, it's pretend, right? You know? Mm -hmm. But I think honoring the story and honoring the tradition of the drum, it was critical to all of us. And I'll have to tell you, when we started, I think we were all not sure uh -huh. if we could get there. And Terry's first lesson with the actors, he did individual sessions with each of them. And I thought, wow, he's a really good teacher. And yet, I wonder, you know, <laughs> will, will everybody be able to rise to it? But each day, you know, the challenge got greater. Mm -hmm. And they were, there was a day, Terry, in rehearsal, I remember, I, I saw you smile and I thought, Oh, he knows what they're capable of now. And then the bar really went up. So it's, it's a lot of dedication to practice, um, to discipline, to knowing what the precision is so that they don't have to wish that it goes well. They know exactly what to do. Last night in rehearsal, Terry, you said um, it, it's not about, you know, if you win the race, then everybody loses. That's What's right. that expression? Yes. Uh, if we win the race, then we lose the competition. If a drummer, if we're rushing, if mm -hmm. there's someone amongst the five of us that are rushing, okay. then it's going to make us not work together. Mm -hmm. So we have to not win the race. We want to win the contest. All of us be together. And yeah. speaking of being together, yeah. obviously at the end of the play, and we won't show an example of what that is, togetherness really matters. Absolutely. Yeah. Talk a little bit about, if you can, just shortly about the training of that, because it's not just they have to have the technique together, they have to like, it's like precise choreography. Yes, it is, and time, it is, it's choreography, it's stick choreography. The beauty of drumming is it's audible and it's visual, and it's more difficult in that level because you have to play with the same stick heights. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult, and you use the same motions to turn the sticks over. It's a lot of work. So uh, getting it to be concise, you just have to do the exercises, go through the rudimental skills. And like Susan said, it's muscle memory. She had mm -hmm. said that early on in learning so that we could reiterate that to everyone. It's muscle memory. Terry, thanks so much for being with us. If people want to know more about Show Me Sound, you've got a website, right? Showmesound.org. And they can, kids can apply, enroll, and Absolutely. people can volunteer? Absolutely. Absolutely, and the information is on the website. Very cool. Showmesound.org. And Carol, we should probably talk a little bit about ticket sales because if people are located yeah. in the St. Louis area, metrotheatercompany.org obviously is your website, but it how is. would people find out for the general audience performances? Tickets are available through the Missouri History Museum, so they can be purchased online, over the phone, uh, at the door, but I'd say don't wait. And when are, I know you've got student matinees starting on Tuesday? Actually, from the 10th of January through the 29th, all the performances are open to the public. Oh, wow. We have weekday uh, matinees at 10 a.m., uh -huh. and then Friday night, Saturday night, Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon, oh, all the way through the good. month. Oh, very good. And don't forget, folks, you can go to the Missouri History Museum website as well to find more about the Civil War in Missouri exhibition. I want to thank Daniel Gonzalez for joining us. I want to thank everybody here at the Auditorium and the Missouri History Museum for making this location available. And Terry, we've got about 15 seconds. Can you take us out with a drum something? Uh, how about the roll? How about doing uh, just roll? Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week for another show from the Missouri History Museum.